Good morning, Vista. I know what some of you are thinking. I am out here way too early in the service, right? It's not normal. This is not the way we do things. And you are right. You are right. I am out here uh, earlier than normal. And let me just kind of put your minds at ease because you might be thinking, I wonder why Dave's out here. So I want to I wanna mention why I'm not out here so you can kind of rest easy, okay? Uh, number one, I am not out here to do any kind of special music, okay? If you grew up in like a traditional church, you know, someone rolls out, does some special music, maybe to like an accompaniment track or something, that's not happening here, okay? I don't, we don't do that. You're welcome. I'm not singing anything, okay? Uh, the other reason that I'm not out here, I'm not out here because my sermon today is so long that I need the full hour, okay? Some of you walking in are like, dear Lord, he's already out there on stage. Got to be kidding me. We're never going to beat the Baptist to lunch now. No, it's fine. Like I'm not, it's actually, today's actually going to be a bit of a shorter sermon um, because later uh, at the end of the service, we actually have um, a a pastor from Haiti, uh, someone that we help sponsor through our our ministry called Together for Haiti. And I want to leave some time at the end for you to hear from uh, Pastor John Alix from Haiti. And it's just a beautiful ministry that's going on there. But the bigger reason why I'm out here earlier in the service, uh, today we're starting a new series called Summer in the Psalms. We're going to be walking through the Old Testament book of Psalms. Um, We're not going to hit every Psalm because there's 150 of them and that would take like three years, okay? Um, But we're going to kind of hop around through the Old Testament book of Psalms. And Psalms, if you're not familiar with Psalms, it is, it's a worship book. That's what it is. Psalms is essentially a book of songs uh, broken up into uh, like five books, Okay, and in fact, the, the Hebrew word um, is the word for praises. Uh, later, they called it, uh, the rabbis called it book of praises. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, version of the, of the Old Testament, um, it was called Psalms. And the, the verb form actually uh, connotates like uh, the twanging of strings or the plucking of strings. So there's a musical association with Psalms. You can think of Psalms like essentially like an Old Testament worship book or, or a hymn book. And so um, if you've been to any, I don't know what denomination you're familiar with, maybe you come from a particular denominational background, maybe you're kind of new to church altogether, one thing you probably are somewhat aware of is the fact that most Christian services follow a particular pattern where people come together and we start with singing some songs. And the reason for that is that the songs coming in together and worshiping together, the idea is that the music sort of prepares our heart then to hear from the word of God. But I thought since we're doing Psalms, which is itself a worship book, maybe for the summer we'll try this where we allow the word of God to really prepare our hearts for for worship, okay? So we're going to flip some things a little bit, right? We're going to do the sermon earlier in the service for the, for the, the series, and then don't worry, Jake and the band, and then Jordan and the band, when he's back in town, they'll come back out and do a little bit more of a worship set on the other end of the sermon. This is going to really confuse all the people that roll in late, and I'm here for it, right? Like, people walking in first service were like, what in the world is going on here, okay? Uh, that was the first thing. When I brought this idea up in our series planning meeting, and I was like, I think I'd like to try the sermon earlier, and then we do worship afterwards. That was the first thing Austin said. Austin was like, do you know how many people are going to walk in late in the middle of your sermon? And I was like, yes. Yes, I do. It's going to happen. Uh, On the plus side, silver lining, those that walk in late will have a little bit easier time finding seats, right? Because uh, if you walk in and the the lights are down and people are standing, it's often very hard to find seats. So there you go. I'm trying to find the silver lining in this whole deal. We're going to give it a shot. If it doesn't work, then we'll pivot and we just won't do that anymore. But um, I I wanted to give it a shot. So if you have your Bibles, go with me to Psalm 1. We're going to be in Psalm 1. Um, It's a shorter psalm, um, but in a lot of ways, Psalm 1, and I wanted to start with this one because Psalm 1 does not have a heading. Um, Maybe in your Bible it does, but the original Hebrew, Psalm 1 was one of the, it's one of the only psalms that does not have a heading. And the reason for that is that uh, most scholars would, would, would say that Psalm 1 is sort of a summary or a heading or a preface to all of the other psalms. The big idea is, is a delight or a love for God and for God's word that sort of guides your life. And, um, and again, that is a message that sort of pervades all of the psalms. So Psalm 1 is where we'll start. Um, and let me just give you some, uh, some trivia, right? If you want to wanna win some Bible trivia, let me just give you some things about psalms that you may or may not be aware of, all right? Um, First of all, Psalms is the largest book in your Bible, okay? The largest book in the Bible. It is also the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. It is quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament Testament book. 
Uh, Psalm 117 is, in fact, the very middle chapter of your Bible. Um, and then Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in, in your Bible, okay? Okay. Um, Psalms, like I said, is essentially a collection of songs. It's arranged in five different books. And so at the beginning of Psalm 1, you might see where it says book 1. And then that goes through uh, 1 through Psalm 41. And then at the beginning of right before Psalm 42, you'll see book 2, okay? And and so on throughout all of the Psalms. A collection of songs put together in in one larger book. Uh, There are at least seven different authors to the Psalms. Um, And I won't walk through every one of them, but one of the more popular, one of the more prominent is King David. Uh, King David uh, wrote at least 73 of them. There may be a few others that don't specifically mention him, but he wrote at least 73, meaning that King David wrote uh, roughly half of the Psalms were written by King David. And what's interesting about Psalms is, um, and the reason we can kind of hop around is that they're not in some sequential order, and they often, a lot of the Psalms have different sort of themes, There's different types or different kinds of psalms, and we're going to try to hit some of those different ones this summer. There are psalms of wisdom. There are psalms of lamentation or sadness and sorrow. There are psalms of repentance, psalms of kingship or what we would call messianic psalms that sort of point to Christ. Uh, There are psalms then of of thanksgiving and praise and worship, and so there's all um, all different sort of types of psalms. And and what I love about that is um, no matter where you are in your life, no matter what kind of baggage you might have brought in here, no matter what you're dealing with, uh, there is a psalm uh, for you. It it sort of runs the the gamut of human emotion. Psalms are all over the place. I used to joke and say, King David comes across in the psalms like somebody that really struggles with ADD. You ever notice that? Like he is literally like, God, you're amazing and you're awesome and I praise you with all of my being. And the next minute he's like, God, where are you? And my enemies are right around the corner and I don't even know if you can hear my prayer. And like, he's just, he's all over the place, right? King David is all over the place. And I love that. I love that about the Psalms. Um, in particular, you'll notice that the Psalms, they, they express the highest of highs, Um, Joy and happiness and victory and then the lowest of lows, depression, anxiety, and loneliness. Austin talked about this in his his series, um, I believe it was several years ago now or uh, at least a little bit over a year where he, the songs series, how sometimes music can express things that sometimes we just have a a hard time vocalizing with mere words. And I think Psalms is a, good, is a good indicator of that. Sometimes what the heart and what the mind and what we struggle with, wrestle with the gamut of our emotions, sometimes we have a hard time putting those things into words, and so did the, the authors of Psalms, and so they put it to music. And that's essentially what, what this is, all right? And so, like I said, Psalm 1 is, uh, is where we'll start. And Psalm 1 begins with, blessed is the man. And so uh, just a real quick, man in the Hebrew is a more general, more generic word. It doesn't mean males only. It means person. Blessed is the person. So Psalm 1 literally begins with blessed or how to be blessed. Here is a way to be blessed. It reads a little bit like an Old Testament beatitude, right? If you remember the Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament, Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount, his longest block of teaching, with what we call the Beatitudes. And it's blessed is, and he follows it up, blessed is the the poor in spirit, blessed are the, the, the merciful, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he goes through this sort of series of what a blessed life, um, a happy life looks like. Well, Psalm 1 begins, blessed is the man, um, which again, is, is sort of like an Old Testament beatitude. How, how to be blessed. What does a blessed life look like? And so let me just kind of start this way. With that understanding, let me just ask you, what do you think a blessed life looks like, right? What, what, is, what does a blessed life look like? If I were to say, man, tell me or describe for me someone that is living a blessed life, man, what, what kind of things come, come to your mind? We might think of things like, you know, long life. The Bible talks about in the Old Testament in particular, many years. God blesses someone with a longer life. Um, we might think of things like riches or wealth. We might think of things like, um, you know, a good, a good marriage or a lot of kids or big families, okay? These are, these are all uh, ways, especially in the Old Testament, that God blessed people, okay? You, you read about people like Abraham and, and King David and even Solomon. 
And they lived blessed. God blessed their lives. And, and those are things, they all lived very long lives. They, they all were very wealthy. God blessed them with riches and wealth. And, and God blessed them with um, large families. And so sometimes when we think of a blessed life, we tend to think very Old Testament-ish and think, man, that is what a blessed life would look like. But I would encourage you as you read through Scripture, you're going to find that other people that lived a blessed life didn't look anything like that, right? Like in the New Testament, you have guys like John the Baptist, who Jesus called the greatest that's ever lived. Um, The Apostle Paul, who we know is maybe the greatest missionary and church planter the world has ever seen. Even Jesus himself, the Son of God. They didn't live crazy long lives. In fact, all their lives were cut short because they were killed. They weren't rich. None of those guys were rich. In fact, they were very poor for the most part. They didn't, as far as we know, ever marry or have children. They didn't have big families. They were single. And so I I just point that out to you to remind you that God's blessing in your life will often look different than God's blessing in someone else's life, all right? God's blessing in your life will often look different than God's blessing in someone else's life. And so that's important for us to remember, for us to know and to recognize, because what can happen so many times is we can maybe imagine or think of what a blessed life looks like or how we think God ought to bless my life based on something we read about in the Bible. Um, And yet, if you read all of Scripture and you look at a lot of different characters, God's blessing looks very different in different people's lives. And so what can happen is we start to look at the way God blesses other people and think that, well, God's blessing them, but God's not blessing me. Like God's being faithful to them, but God's not being faithful to me. And and what happens is we're just not very grateful or appreciative of the ways in which God is indeed blessing us and God is indeed faithful to us. Blessing throughout Scripture often looks very different. And I would encourage you to think of the ways, maybe even jot down the ways God has blessed or is blessing your life so that you can be grateful for those things because it may not look like the way he blesses anybody else. So we'll get into Psalm 1, and I just want to kind of read it and walk through it with you. And again, I'll I'll, I'll be brief. I'll be brief today. Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the man or the person. And then he starts with what not to do. Like, blessed, and then he says, I love the fact that he, he quickly turns to, here's how not to be blessed, right? Here's how not to be blessed. He says, blessed is the, the man or the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Blessed is the person who doesn't do these things. Now, just as the psalmist starts with what not to do, I want to start explaining this verse by what this verse does not mean, okay? Because there are some bad interpretations of this verse. This is not a blanket commandment to not love or hang around lost people or sinners, okay? This is not a blanket statement saying don't be friends with sinners. Because let's be honest, if we couldn't be friends with sinners, none of us would have any friends, right? Like, that's just the truth right? This is not some don't hang out with bad people, only hang out with good people, okay? That is a poor reading of the text. We know that Jesus himself was a friend of sinners, right? You read the gospels, you will see over and over and over again a pattern of behavior with Jesus, and that is that he hung out with all the wrong kind of people, okay? Jesus called a guy named Matthew to be his disciple. Matthew was a tax collector. Right after Jesus calls Matthew, the tax collector, to be one of his followers, the text says that Matthew then throws a party at his house for all of his low-life, sinner, tax collector friends. And Jesus comes over, and he's hanging out, and he's eating with them, and, and, and just seems to be having a good time with, with all the wrong people. So much so that the Pharisees and the scribes are looking on, and they go, hey, why does your rabbi eat with those people, right? That's what they say. they literally like, why is he hanging out with sinners, Jesus overhears them, and he says, wait, it's not the well that need a physician. It's the sick, right? He said, I've come to to seek and save the lost. I haven't come for all the good people that think they're really righteous. That's not who I'm here to hang out with. And then all through the Gospels, what you see is Jesus hanging out with all the wrong kind of people, all these conversations. Jesus goes through a city one time, and everybody wants to get a glimpse. Everybody wants Jesus to hang out with them. Jesus walks up to a tree, and there's a wee little man named Zacchaeus in it. Zacchaeus was also a tax collector. Nobody liked Zacchaeus. He was hated. He was despised. He ripped off his own people. He embezzled money. He was the jerk of all jerks that nobody wanted to be around. And Jesus goes, 
I want to go to your house. Hmm? Let's have lunch. Zacchaeus like almost falls out of the tree. Jesus goes and hangs out with Zacchaeus. Later, we see Jesus having this unbelievable conversation and engaging with this uh, woman at the well, a very promiscuous woman that Jesus and any rabbi should never be seen with. Jesus goes, has a conversation with her, loves her, points her to the gospel. I mean, it's this beautiful interaction. And over and over and over again, the rich young ruler, Nicodemus, you can see Jesus hung out, loved, befriended sinners. So this is not a don't be friends with sinners verse. That is a poor reading of the text, right? But here's what Jesus didn't do when he hung out with sinners. He didn't try to imitate them, like learn kind of their lifestyle so he could adopt their lifestyle. He didn't pattern his life after sinners. He didn't engage in sin with them, right? He didn't walk up to Zacchaeus and Matthew and go, hey guys, tell me about how you embezzle all that money. That sounds awesome. I want to try that. I want to try, the, I want to try getting rich that way, right? Let me take some notes. He doesn't go to the woman at the well and go, tell me about sleeping with a lot of different people. That sounds fun, right? No, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't pattern his life after sinners. He doesn't adopt sin, doesn't engage in sin with them. And so that's essentially what the psalmist is getting at, right? The psalmist isn't saying, don't hang out with sinners, don't befriend sinners, don't love sinners. He's saying, be careful who you pattern your life after, Be careful who you imitate, who you listen to for advice and counsel. That's what you got to be careful of. He uses the verbs walks, stands, and sits. These verbs, again, the connotation is your pattern of living. Your pattern of living. In fact, this this is how sin works in our life. We've talked about sin before. We've said before about sin that... You know, we start out in sin by what? We we take a step. We take a step into sin. And at first, it's no big deal, or we think it's no big deal. It's just a small sin. It's a small thing. Nobody will notice. It doesn't matter to anybody but me. It's not a problem. But pretty soon, what happens? Stepping turns into what? Walking, right? Pretty soon, we become more comfortable in it. We become comfortable taking those steps, and we begin to walk in sin, one foot after another. Pretty soon when we've gotten really comfortable, we've been walking in sin for a while, what happens? Then it becomes a bit of a fixed position. We begin to stand in it, right? My convictions, my decisions, my attitudes, my state of mind, it's more fixed. Sin is no big deal. This is who I am. This is, this is what I can do. And once we've stood in it for a while, then ultimately it leads to this place of, of sitting where we just become comfortable in sin with no real desire to even get out of it. It becomes this way of life that's so comfortable to us that, that again, it doesn't even matter to us anymore. It's a fixed position of our heart that we just just live in sin. And so you see the downward spiral that is sin in our lives from from stepping in it at first to, to walking in it, standing in it, and ultimately sitting in it. And the connotation, again, is a way of life. It's a way of life. This is what sin does. We've said before, sin... Sin doesn't stay put. Man, most of us think, man, sin's not a problem. I can can manage it. You can't manage your sin. You can't. Sin always grows and it festers and 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 it takes on a life of its own. That's why, again, we can't manage sin. We can't keep it on a shelf because it doesn't stay on the shelf. And so Psalm 1, the walking, the standing, the sitting, it's talking about a lifestyle, a downward spiral in our lives. Those who live this way, those are, not those, those are not the ones that are blessed of God. They're not the ones that are blessed of God. Then in verse 2, um, he shifts in contrast to say, okay, here's what uh, someone that is blessed, here's what, they, here's what their life looks like, okay? In verse 2, he says this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I love I love this verse, and what I love about it is that the psalmist does not use the word obey. He uses the word delight. You notice that? He doesn't say, here's how to be blessed. Obey God's law, right? That's not what he says. And that's a big deal because, um, let's be honest, that would be religion, wouldn't it? Like religion essentially says, I want to do the right things. I want to follow the rules, follow the law, check the boxes, go through the motions religiously so that God will be happy with me, God will be pleased with me, and my life will be good. That's religion, right? I want to do all the right stuff and avoid all the wrong stuff, and I want to obey. I want to be a good, obedient person. And so what the psalmist doesn't say, 
He who obeys God's word, he takes it a step further. He brings the heart into it, and he says, it's he who delights in God's word. That's, that's different. That's a different level, right? Delighting in something, finding joy and peace and satisfaction in something. That's different. True delight in God's word will lead ultimately to obedience to it, or at least a striving for obedience to it. However, just striving for obedience to God's word, it doesn't always lead to delight in it. Are you with me? I'll say that again. True delight in God's word leads to obedience to it. However, just striving for obedience to God's word doesn't always lead to delight in it. You can just do stuff to go through the motions and never really love it. Begrudging sort of submission to a list of rules and laws is not what God's after for you. God's after your heart. God's after your heart. You're not pleasing God by being like, well, I guess I got to do that. I don't really want to, but God wants me to, so I guess I better do these. I guess I better give some money, or I guess I better, you know, love the, the poor, or I guess I better. No. God wants your heart. And so I love the fact the psalmist doesn't say, he who does all these things checks the boxes, they're good. No. He who delights in God, who delights in the word of God. I've said it this way before, but love uh, leads to obedience. Obedience doesn't always lead to love. And that's an important reminder for parents as well, right? Sometimes we, we get caught up and I want to have obedient children, obedient, obedient, obedient. Listen, you can press and you can be firm and you can be a disciplinarian and you can scream and yell and you can discipline and you can, you can do all those things to have obedient children. And at the end of the day, there's a chance they will not love you one bit. They might even resent you. But if you can love your kids and you can have a relationship with your kids where they love you, listen, there's a far greater chance that they're going to want to be, want to be obedient to you. Love leads to obedience. Genuine true love leads to obedience. Obedience does not always lead, does not always lead to love. And that is, that's essentially what the psalmist is, is declaring here. His delight is in the law of the Lord. Okay, we'll finish up um, the rest of this really quick. Verse 3 says this. He gives this kind of picture. It says, he then is like a tree who's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. He gives the picture of, of a tree by a river whose roots run deep, plenty of nutrients, plenty of water. Therefore, the tree is strong, it is firm, and it's bearing fruit. This is, um, echoes what Jesus says in the New Testament, right? That true disciples, how are you going to know someone really loves Jesus? Well, by their fruit. That's what the Bible says. You'll know them by their fruit. If you are a true disciple of Christ, your life is going to be producing something, Okay. Your life's going to be producing something. Now, I don't have time this morning to kind of walk through all of the ways in which our lives can bear fruit. Um, if you want to go back, I think it was Palm Sunday where I preached. I actually broke down and talked a little bit more about what it looks like specifically. I think five ways that Scripture talks about our lives bearing fruit. So you can go on our website and check that out. Um, but at the end of the day, Jesus is saying, true disciples, true followers of Jesus, man, they're going to reveal themselves by, by what they do. Your life bears fruit. And the psalmist is saying the same thing. If you love God and you delight in his word, your life is going to look a little different. Your life is going to be bearing some fruit. The opposite then is also true. Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. The chaff was um, essentially like the, the, the pointless, useless part of the wheat. It was really good for nothing. It had no real value whatsoever. Jesus is, I mean, the psalmist here is saying this. You, you have one of two choices, right? And, and if you choose to live in the way of sinners, right, to, to, to walk, to stand, to sit in the way of sinners, um, what's happening is you are wasting your life. You're wasting the life that God gave you. The breath in your lungs, the heartbeat in your chest. If you choose to, to walk in the way of sinners with your life, you're, you're, you're wasting that life, and it's, it has no real value. It just has no real value. Therefore, he says in verse 5, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let me end by sort of pointing us to the gospel really quick, all right? Here's the truth of the matter if we're honest. If we're honest, all of us fall short of the conditions for God's blessing, if we're honest. All of us do. Every one of us have walked, stood, and sat in sin. 
if we're honest. Every one of us have delighted in things or people more so than we have delighted in God. We just, if we're honest, we have to acknowledge that. We all fall short of these conditions, man. We've all messed up. We've all, we've all, we've all gone our, our own way and we're all very selfish by nature. And so the only one that really, that's ever lived a life that is worthy of the condition for God's blessing is Jesus himself. He lived a perfect sinless life. God knew that we were sinners that could never measure up and never match up. And that's why he sends Jesus, right? And I started the sermon earlier by talking about how God's blessing in our life may look different. God's practical, tangible blessing in your life may look different. But there's one way in which we have all already been blessed. There's one way in which we share a blessing, and that is that we have all been blessed in Christ. Every one of us. Every one of us. For God so loved what? The world, right? That's pretty all-encompassing, isn't it? All of us have been blessed in Christ. Jesus comes and he goes to a cross and he dies on a cross for our sin, for all of the ways in which we have walked and stood and set in sin, for all of the things we have delighted in that are not of God. Christ died for those things. He died for those things. And so if we place our faith in him, listen, if you want to live a blessed life, and I hope that that's your goal, it is for me, I, I want a blessed life. I'm telling you, it starts with placing your faith in the finished work of Jesus. That's where a blessed life starts. That's where a blessed life starts. And maybe you're here and you, you've, you're a Christian, you've been a Christian, you've already done that, but maybe you've sort of drifted a bit, or maybe you are walking in some sin or standing in some sin or, or even sitting and laying and wallowing in it, right? I don't know. Here's the thing. Christ still died for you. His sacrifice is still good for you. And if you want to live a life of blessing, it's not about play, praying for riches and wealth and long life and a perfect little marriage and family. Like those things, you pray for those all you want. But at the end of the day, a blessed life is someone who has trusted in the finished work of Jesus. That's what a blessed life looks like. That's where a blessed life starts. And that is our invitation to you today. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your word. And God, I pray today specifically that you would, um, you would help us move beyond just trying to be obedient to it all the time. And God, while, while I think we want obedience to it, at the end of the day, God, your word reminds us that, that you want more from us than just that. God, you want us to delight in you. You want us to delight in your word. God, your word that ultimately reveals you. It reveals the person and work of Jesus. And that's what it's all about. So God, I pray today that you would give us delight in you, delight in your word, not just begrudging submission to a bunch of rules. Father, I pray today that we would just um, ultimately, God, that, that, a, that a blessed life, we'd be reminded that a blessed life starts with faith in you. So today, God, we're thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for your great sacrifice for us. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful, God, that while we are people that admittedly we walk and we stand and we sit in sin, we are admittedly, God, we delight in things that are not of you. We are grateful today that you have paid the price for those things. And so today, Father, we just pray. I pray for those that are here that have maybe drifted from you, that have maybe um, kind of been walking their own path, those that have never placed their faith in you, that today might be a day they trust in Jesus. We pray this in Christ's beautiful name. Amen. Amen.